Hey everybody, this is Corey Lambertson and Evan Kemper from Whitmix Corporation uh, coming at you for this third session of Surgical Guides 101. Uh, so today we're going to cover how to, uh, sorry, how to 3D print surgical guides on the uh, Verbuild, Whitmix Verbuild 3D printer and also we're going to highlight it on the Asiga Max 3D printer and I also have a little sneak peek uh, maybe of the 4K build plate size for those that are interested in seeing how big the 4K build plate is that's coming from a Sega. It will nest a couple on there so you guys can see what the output is on the big printer itself. Uh, so from here, very first thing, we're gonna have Evan go ahead and show a little tip and trick and how to get the uh, the actual outputs of uh, the surface scans from Splint Studio into Dental System and what you can do with that. So we'll spend a couple minutes this morning on that. And just a reminder to all, this is being recorded and there are, it is, it is qualified for CE credits. So if you need the CE credits, you'll be able to go ahead and uh, apply for those and take the quiz for that. And then also for those that were scheduled to be on the Monday webinar, remember it was moved till Tuesday. You will have to re-register if you're going to watch it for the uh, for the uh, the RPD uh, modules that we're going to be covering in three shapes. So uh, once again, my name is Corey Lambertson, and we have Evan Kemper that is going to take it away. Evan Kemper is our application engineer. So go for it, Evan. All right. So on Wednesday, we did have a question about um, whether we could take the denture and um, use the implant position to put screw holes in it. And we said we weren't sure on Wednesday, but we went ahead and checked it out. You can indeed um, do that. So I'm going to show the process of basically turning the denture into a provisional all CAD CAM. Um, so the first thing we're going to do in dental system is create a new order. Then I'm going to select my implant sites. Are you sharing your screen? Oh, I am not. Good <laughs> call. It's hard for people to see if I'm not sharing. Uh, let's blow this up real quick. Uh, it says the host disabled participant screen sharing. Can I let's see if I can fix that? Um, one second. Yeah. Technical difficulties. Um, we did have a question come in. Is Evan really that much taller than me on the screen? The, the answer is yes. Okay. All right, we got it now. All right, so everybody should be able to see my screen now. Let me just close out this order form. So we'll do a new order. We're going to select our implant sites. And we're going to go into under abutment and we're going to go to wax up abutment. And then we're going to pick our platform. Now this would have to, does the platform have to match what was prescribed um, in the implant system or from the, no. from the implant studio? No. Nope. It's just going to use the coordinates to put whatever analog uh, out of the library selection here. Um, okay. You know, it's just going to use it for placement. Um, but you would like, you know, if you're going to be restoring on, say, in this case, I went back and did it in Strawman um, RC, then you would want to make sure whatever company or platform you're using here, whatever tie base uh, is appropriate for that implant system. Gotcha. But it doesn't have to be necessarily like Strawman brand. Okay. Um, so the next thing we're going to do is just also bridge these together. And just give it a name and I'm going to say, okay. Then I'm going to import scans. And if we remember from yesterday, 
it would, uh, when we did the edentulous workflow, or not yesterday, Wednesday, we have a lower gingival with implant info that it exports and then lower jaw scan. Um, so the lower gingiva is like the tissue that was extracted that also has um, the implant location. So we're going to import that as the preparation scan. And then it's going to ask us for a wax up bridge scan. And we're going to do that with the denture that has the implant info. Gotcha. And that's all I got to do there. I'm just going to double click to enter the order. Pretty excited to see how well this works. Oh yeah, it's super slick. All right, so we just have to do a little occlusal plane adjustment here. And really this isn't that important unless you're gonna go make a printed model out of it um, later. But we'll just, to keep things correct, we'll go ahead and set that. And I'm not going to sculpt on it at all. So here you can see the implant analogs that have come in in the position of our implants, Very as cool. well as the tie bases. So all I need to do is just click on the scan um, to annotate where these are, when it's already just telling me where to click. I can go next. And we can adjust the insertion direction if we want, but I'm not going to change that. More just converting the bridge anyway, or the, the denture. So, and just so everybody knows, Evan is using the 2020 beta software, and yep. it should be supposedly released any day now. So, we're yep. really excited for that to be launched. Uh, this is available on 2019 and I believe 2018 as well. So if you have any of the previous versions, you can duplicate this workflow. Yep. So now all we're doing is um, our uh, cutout lines. Basically, if you've done any kind of implant work in 3Shape, um, like with the actual tissue, gingival tissue on it, you have to put like implant protection windows in. So this is similar, but what we're doing is telling it where like Basically, anything inside this circle is where it has freedom to adjust the design uh, down to this interface. So we just want to make sure we're kind of wider than the implant. You don't have to be like super wide, but I'm just left clicking and adjusting. And then right here under active, um, active cut spline, you can just push the arrows back or forth to switch so like this one definitely needs a correction here now if it was to like let's say if you didn't change it and you tried to proceed forward would it air out or how would you know uh typically yeah it would air out um okay there's also a check cut splines option but what i found on this is it seems to be kind of considering that more for um like actual crown and bridge dies Right. So it, it didn't really give me any uh, feedback that was helpful. Gotcha. And probably if you, if your spline wasn't proper, you'd probably have a weird meshing issue as well that you'd be able to physically see as well, I would imagine. Yeah, yeah. Finish up on the last one. I'm good with that. Actually, let's bring it up a little higher over here. Then I can just click next. And you can see it's now connected it to the interface. That was easy. Yeah, like super fast. And I have a sculpt step now. So like well, probably one of the first things I do is come in here, get rid of the uh, the um, radio opaque marker indentations. You can see here that denture is a little shallow for that interface um, or thin there. So I'm going to bulk it up in this area. And you have all the tools you have in your normal sculpt toolkit. Just add a little Very material nice. around here. 
Now, one thing I did notice playing around with this, um, if you're going to cut off like the lingual um, flange, it's a little tricky. Or I mean, it, you can. It might be easier to just cut it, you know, off uh, with like a hand piece later. Have you tried using the plane cut option, or is that what you did? No, I sculpted. Um, I thought about trying the plane cut. We'll actually try it now, but I think it, what it may do is um, wipe everything out in between. Wipe everything out. Yeah, it's just does the whole thing. So would you do that just for like hygienic purposes? Yeah, oh, actually, there you go. It actually does oh, wow. Work. So, yeah, it's um, hygiene. Hmm. <laughs> Who would have thunk? Oh, <laughs> there you go. Um, so it very well could have just been maybe a, a f oh. So yeah. yeah, you play around with that and then then you can probably sculpt it from there pretty quickly. I uh, see so the smooth tool kind of pinches it in between, mm -hmm. which is probably where you get a lot of issues. Now, one thing to be aware of is that, you know, if I've made it heavy in places, there, there is no cut to tissue option. So just make sure you check that out. Um, and you could still use the like uh, minus tool to take more off if you wanted to, and then come back and smooth it. Gotcha. Um, but that'll be kind of up to you. It might be easier for you to just do it by hand later. Anyway, so get the idea there. Uh, you could do that on any border. Then we'll just go next to assembly. Um, it's just telling me I'm below a minimum thickness here, but uh, I think that's probably just a false positive. Right. So I'm going to go on. I mean, it's a full denture, so. And it was saying that it was thin by three millimeters. <clears throat> yeah. So here you can see it's put the screw holes in. Wow. And if we wrong scan, get rid of everything here. We have our interfaces for our tie base. Cool. And if you had a library that supported the screw lip being in the design, then it, the screw lip would be in this design here and you wouldn't need the insert. Uh, we can do an angled screw hole if we want by checking that box. Let's say we wanted those two posterior ones to not come out on the denture teeth. And you can angle them, preview it. And if you're happy with it, we can go next. Just wait for it to save. Close out here. That is, um, <laughs> crazy fast yeah well if you think about you know instead of spending time trimming that border you know you print this out of you know the denka provisional material yeah or you know any provisional material that's approved for that process and then um it'd be, it'd be pretty quick to grind that off and then put some pink composite on the the uh, facial buckle sides of it to cover it up the tooth shade Absolutely. So yeah, so you could easily, you could easily mill this in PMA, you could easily 3D print mm -hmm. it with the Denka Crown and Bridge material, which both the Asiga Max and the Whitmix Variable 3D printer is validated for. Uh, I mean, that would be, that'd yeah. be awesome. Now, do you think you could e immediate, immediately load those implants with this or? Mm, I mean, I guess that, that'll depend more on, you know, the situation, the patient, what bones there. Yeah. Um, 
so that'll be on a per case kind of basis but um you know this will give you something that you don't have to probably don't have to reline unless you know the one thing about guided surgery is there's always a chance some you know the guide needs to be set aside and you know the yeah. go back to a traditional surgery style in which case the implant probably won't be exactly where it was planned so this would get you close but you might have to grind it out a little and then reline it but the concept here is that you know the surgery is fully guided and everything goes as planned then you should be able to just yeah you know cement in your inserts and then this should drop right onto the um, implants i mean it's for how easy it was to do i mean you could you could do this for almost every case for the amount of time it took. I mean, seriously. Yeah, I mean, it took, it's, it, it, it's like five minutes if you're not sitting there explaining it. So, yeah. So five minutes of time, $3 worth of resin, charge them for it, you know, and, and uh, just as an option, even mm -hmm. really step up the service level that you can provide. Yeah. And that puts them back in a provisional. That's the same as the denture they had, you know, right. at least in function. Right. All right, so let me, uh, I'll transfer this over to you in case you want to show nesting it, but. Yeah, sure. Let's go ahead and let's do it. Just drop it in. I'm just going to put it in here with the Implant Studio stuff. It works. All right, so with that, I'm going to hand it over to Corey. All right, so host disabled participant sharing. Yeah, looks like we're gonna have to switch around who's host for this one. Let me um, switch you to host real quick. Okay, let me know when you're ready. So here what we'll do first is what I like to do is I say we go ahead and let's cover uh, the IFU for the surgical guide material to make sure that you understand where to get it at and how to use the material properly. And then we'll dive into the two different 3D printers and cover the nesting software. We're not actually gonna print live today. And part of that reason is because we have seen that over the last three weeks or actually four, four weeks, five weeks where we have printed live. The principle and process is the same for loading the resin and actually printing. Uh, so let me go ahead and share my screen. All right, so everybody should be able to share the screen. Once again, if anybody has any questions at any time, please feel free to ask. So I'm going to start on the the actual Whitmix website. So if we go to Whitmix.com, there's uh, a couple sections here that I want to cover for very useful information. So if we go to products, and if we select on 3D print resins, we can actually find the full list of uh, resins that Whitmix offers and also sells. So what we're printing today, or what we're referring to would be our Veriguide OS resin. This is our surgical guide resin. Now this is a class one medical device. So the requirement for the materials is not gonna be as strict as what we see with our, uh, like our splint material, which is a class two. So when we get into the Veriguide wet resin on our website itself, um, it gives us some just general information about the material, but most importantly, it shows us a link to our Veriguide OS instruction manual. Uh, so I'm gonna go ahead and select that. And from here, it gives us some very useful information. So uh, when we go through the design process itself, it gives us some design requirements. So Evan was following the guideline for this material in the carbon printer. However, uh, for outside of the carbon network, there are some design requirements. So the minimum wall thickness we need to be is two millimeters. The internal offset needs to be uh, greater than or equal to 0.1 millimeters. Now you, you can still go below that, but we found on average the 0.1 millimeter seems to fit really well. Uh, blackout for any sort of angles for undercuts is zero, retention is zero. And then the offset for the sleeve, we recommend to start at 100 microns and then make your adjustments from there. Uh, the processing for the printing really just needs to be at an ambient temperature between 20 to 30 degrees Celsius. Uh, but most importantly, we want to print in 50, 70, or 100 micron layers. And we do not want to add any supports to the intaglio surface. Uh, we're going to cover that here in a moment. Post-processing of this material is fairly simple, like all printed materials. We're going to go ahead and clean it in an ultrasonic cleaner or any other alcohol or any, um, any other, I guess, cleaning unit or cleaning station. 
And it's going to be at least a minimum of five to 10 minutes of actual cleaning in the alcohol bath. Uh, you want to use an alcohol bath that is agitating the, the alcohol itself. So there's a couple uh, like blender style alcohol baths like Form Labs has one that would still work for this material. Uh, I believe we're going to be coming out with a also a cleaning unit as well and it has two separate baths and it's also uh, it's, we're no longer using the ultrasonic it's more of like a blender style uh, which really works well. Uh, from that after your alcohol bath is complete that's when you need to actually cure the the actual uh, surgical guide. So there is a curing protocol. In our IFU, we have listed just the auto flash curing unit for 6,000 flashes. However, you don't have to, you're not, you're not just stuck with just the auto flash curing unit. You can use just about any other curing unit on the market as long as it has a wavelength between 300 to seven nanometers and you can get a 200 watt output for 10 minutes. So go ahead and take a look at the curing unit you have. Uh, if you have the Uvatron, you can use it. If you have the Sika Flash unit, uh, that's where it's a little bit iffy because it, it does reach between the 300 to 700 nanometers. However, it's not a 200 watt output. Uh, you'd have to dose up the amount of time. So there is a formula I believe you can use for the dosage of light for a certain watt output to be able to achieve the same uh, requirements. Uh, so from here, Let's go ahead and talk about the two printers that we have to be able to use this resin. Now this resin is open source resin. So if you have other 3D printers, you can use it. If you have, uh, for example, let's say if you have one of the uh, like less expensive units that are like LCD based, you can use it on those printers. If you have a DLP printer like an Asiga, you can use it. Or if you had like a uh, 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 like the Strawman printer, for example, you can dial it in and use it in that printer. Uh, it is open source, so you can use it just by any printer. Uh, the Verabilt LCD, you can use it in this printer here. And so if you go to this website, if you go to Whitmix.com, you can find some information about the printer itself. Something that's cool is that you can download the software directly from our website. And if you just want to play with the nesting software, if you're thinking about buying a printer, you can gain it right there. Uh, and of course, we also have the Asiga Max 3D printer. Uh, this material is validated on this printer as well. And the, I believe you can get the software directly from the website if you want to play with it. Uh, this is just a, a DLP 3D printer versus the variable as an LCD printer. So let's go ahead and let's dive into the actual softwares themselves. If you do have an Asiga 3D printer and you are not using our resin yet, if you go back to the, the resin page itself, you need to get the INI file from our website. And so if you go to winmix.com, products, fair guide OS, on the right-hand side under technical resources, there's a tab that says fair guide OS 19.1 material file. You'll want to download that material file. Uh, or you can get it from Asiga's website, asiga.com, if you log into your account. So let's first actually highlight the Alpha 3D software. So this is the software that we're going to use for the VeraBuild. And I actually captured the four different surgical guides uh, that Evan created earlier this week. So the very first thing you're going to do is you're going to make sure it's set for the VeraBuild 3D printer. And then we're going to choose the material we want to use. So from here, if we select on the drop down, we can see that we have all of the Vera model resins. We also have our Vera guide, which is a surgical guide resin that we're highlighting and the Dentka resins. Now, if we were gonna go ahead and print the provisional that Evan just created, you would want to choose the Denka crown and bridge material. Now this is a temporary material that's good for 30 days in the, uh, in the oral cavity. Uh, this is the same for the uh, Sega Max as well. It is validated. They are both obtained or they're both under that 510K umbrella with Denka, which is really exciting. Before this, I'm gonna choose our surgical guide resin, Veriguide OS. And then I'm going to choose the layer thickness I want to print in. So I'm going to print this in 100 micron layers. And from here, I'm just going to select apply. So I'm going to go ahead and rotate the screen around. And let's get it centered a little bit. And let's go ahead and import in our STL files. So I'm going to go to the top left-hand side where there's a folder. And I'm going to search for my STL files. So I have these on the desktop. All right, so I'm gonna go ahead and import all of them and let's see what happens. I think we'll be able to fit them all in. 
Looks like we can. Uh, it's going to be a tight squeeze. We're going to have to angle a lot of these uh, on a 45 degree angle to be able to get them on. It may be a tight squeeze. We'll, we'll give it a shot. So from here, I'm going to go and select on the first surgical guide I want to manipulate. And I'm going to go over to turn or move. And I'm going to rotate this around. It's kind of hard to see with all of them in, so it may have been a better option to not actually bring everything in all at once. So let's move it out of the way so we can actually see what we're doing. All right. So I'm going to go ahead and manipulate the next one as well. I'm going to rotate this over to about a 45 degree angle. Oops. See if we'll be able to fit all three of these in here. So after I have them all in the orientation I want, I'm going to go ahead and have it try to auto nest. Let's see what happens. All right, so it's saying it can actually fit three of them in. So we're gonna go ahead and we'll have to choose which ones we want to delete. And then we'd have to actually send in another job over. So from here, I can see, let's go ahead and actually, let's do the stackable guide itself. So I have, here's the actual surgical guide itself. And then here's the actual, uh, the I guess the placement jig that would go on top. So you can actually press down to keep the guide in position when you're anchoring it down. So I'm gonna delete off this guide here. And let's go ahead and let's nest again and let's see what happens. Very good. So now we can see everything is on the build envelope itself. So the next stage from here, I'm gonna look at it from a top point of view is we actually need to apply our supports. So something I've found with printing with this printer, so I'm gonna go over to the left where it says add supports. I wanna change my support height to five millimeters. Um, I found with this material on this printer, if we get it too close to the build plate, it'll actually cure to the build plate, uh, the actual object and cure through the supports. So I need to actually apply a little space there. So I select it on the object and then I'm gonna change this support height to five millimeters. And then I'm going to hit auto support. And it's going to automatically place the supports on the object for me. Now I can see I had it just go with the default support orientation. Let's say if I wanted to go with the actual, uh, let's see here, the structure style supports. If I update, let's see the supports, let's go with the structure and then auto support that again we'll see that they're gonna be interconnected. I really like printing with these interconnected supports. So I'm gonna do the same for this guide here. I'm gonna put it to five millimeters, change the support type to structure, auto support it. And then we have our final guide here. Change it to structure. and auto support. So we can see there's actually, I mean, if we had a smaller surgical guide, we could probably intertwine this a little bit deeper and actually fit all four on here. Uh, it'd be a tight squeeze, but I think we could make it happen. So just to see all the models with the supports on it, I mean, this has been, I think maybe three minutes of working. We've got everything actually in the build envelope oriented the way it needs to be printed and then supported as well. For our surgical guides, uh, this printer on the Verbuild, you're gonna wanna go with the orientation of between 30 to about 65 degrees uh, for uh, the highest accuracy to be able to achieve it. I can see this guy here, I made actually a little bit, a uh, little bit more vertical. I should actually tilt him in a little bit. So I'm gonna undo the supports for that guy. And then I'm gonna come in and place the angulation. There we go. There we go, that looks a little bit more natural. So now let's go back and let's apply the supports to that. Thank you, you too, take care. All right. 
Now, if you look at it from a top view again, I can see that I'm crossing through. So I will need to move this guide over. Let's go ahead and let's just rotate it completely. There we go. Pretty easy. Yeah. So from here, the very final step to actually get this over to the printer is we're going to slice and print my model. So when I select on the save option, which is slice and print, we have one last option to change the material or change the layer thickness. So I'm still gonna go with 100 micron layers. And then I'm gonna change this name. So I'm gonna call this SG101. So from here, I'm gonna select save. It's going to take the actual three-dimensional structures and begin the slicing process. From there, let's see if I have this open. I think I have a printer that I can connect to. Let's see. I may not have one of the printers turned on. Let's see if that connects. So wait for this to load. But from here, after this is done, it's going to create a file location of where the, uh, the actual sliced file is. From there, you can either place it on a USB stick and plug it into the back of the printer and print it, or you can actually upload it directly from the, uh, from the actual printer web interface, which the printer does have to be powered on. I was working on a printer the other day, so I, I don't think I actually have it powered on at this point in time. All right, so from here, it shows the actual location. So the default location is C drive, 3DP data, and then the name of the file. It has a date and timestamp along with it. And then this IBF file is what will actually upload onto your thumb drive. So if you have a thumb drive, a USB stick, then you'll drop it in for those that are, have network restrictions. And then if you have the actual, um, looks like, okay, it looks like it is connecting. There we go. Yeah, I just booted it up. Thanks. <laughs> Appreciate it. So from here, um, if we go into our VariBuild printer, uh, under here, when you actually are connected to it to the web interface through the network, if you go under print, you have the ability to choose files. From here, I'm going to go to add. And then I'm going to go to my, let's see here, where did I put that? The C drive. 3DP data, 3DP data, surgical guide 101. Here's my file. I'm going to select open. It's going to upload it. Wait for it to upload. It was a little bit of a bigger file. So depending on your network speeds, it may be a little bit longer. So from here, we can see it's uploaded. I'm going to select OK. I'm going to find surgical guide 101. Select next. It's going to default to my printer, and then I would select print. Now, I don't want to select print on it. I don't have the material in here, but that's how you'd actually start it for the variable printer itself. Uh, pretty straightforward, fairly easy. Let's go ahead and see how it compares to the Asiga software, the Composer software. So I'm going to minimize this, close out of here, minimize here. So let's go ahead and open up the Asiga Composer software. So this is the newest version for the Asiga Composer. When I create a new build, I'm going to select on new. And then from here, I can see all the printers that I'm going to connect to. Um, as a bonus, like mentioned, we do have the Pro 4K80 as an option. I will show the build plate size in relation to the surgical guides uh, once I'm done nesting and sending this job over. So I'm going to select on my printer that I have in the practical lab, and then I'm going to choose my material. So I'm going to go ahead and select under the material dropdown my Veriguide OS, and then I'm going to choose my layer thickness. So it is defaulting to 100 micron layers. From here, I'm gonna select OK. And now I'm going to import my parts in. So I'm gonna to go to Add Parts, Select Files. I'm gonna search for it on my desktop, oops. Now the build plate on the Max is just slightly bigger. I'm gonna see if we can actually place all the parts in together. The cool thing about the Sega Max is because it's in that ultraviolet uh, light spectrum, I can print these in or any orientation. They do not need to be on a specific angle. So I can actually print all of these 
vertically if I wanted to. I'm gonna see if I can snake this one in horizontally as well. So let's look at it from a top point of view. Oh, I think we'll have plenty of space to fit all these on. Oh yeah. So from here, after I have my objects in the build envelope, I can see that these are purple. I'm gonna go ahead and raise or bring down this surgical guide. See how they're all purple? That means that they're actually passing through or outside of the print boundary. From here, I'm gonna to go to add parts and it's gonna automatically raise them up above. So I'm gonna hit apply. And so it's gonna automatically apply the supports. Now, one feature that this software does not have that the Alpha 3D software has is that it does not have that structure style support. So it does not have that ability to interweave the supports to create that rigid structure, unfortunately. So from here, if I was to right click and rotate my screen around, I can see my four surgical guides. And then from here, the next step or final step is to actually send it to the printer itself. So I'm gonna go up to the build wizard. From here, it shows the actual name of the printer, the material we're using. I'm gonna select next through this. And then I have the ability to add separation detection in fast print mode which is really cool. So with this printer, you have the ability to actually increase the mechanical movements of it with fast print mode and then separation detection is where it actually detects separation between layers. I'm gonna go ahead and add a base plate of 0.3 millimeters underneath my printed structures and I'm gonna select next. So from here, it's saying that it's gonna take three hours and 40 minutes and 54 seconds to print all three surgical guides, which is actually really fast. Um, and it's a total of 60, almost 60 millimeters. So from here, I'm gonna select next again. And I'm gonna go ahead and name this, uh, let's call it SG101. And the final step to get this to the printer is select send build. So for this printer, it is a little bit different. Oh, I got a warning. So it says duplicate facets. This is actually coming from the support render. You just simply hit ignore whenever you get this. It'll probably do it for all four guides as well. I'm gonna hit ignore there. Let's see, looks like it actually went through for all of them, cool. So from here, the very next step is to actually just start the print job from the printer. So there is a, a difference here between the Alpha 3D and the Composer software, where the Alpha 3D, you have to manually upload a job file to the printer versus the Composer software, it automatically uploads it to the printer itself. Uh, on both machines, you do have to start the print job directly from the printer though or through the web interface. So from here, I have the ability to view slices. So I can play through the slices. So it shows every single layer that's gonna be printed and exposed. And the final step would be to jump to the printer web interface, go to the front panel and actually start the print job itself. So really simple. So from here, now that we've seen how to upload this from the Sega Max, I do want to do that quick bonus. Uh, then we'll be able to jump to any questions that you guys may have about the printers, the surgical guide material itself, um, or just the overall process. We still have a little bit of time. So if you have any questions for Evan on the design, we'd be more than happy to answer those. Yep. So just to cover as that bonus, let's go ahead and see the size comparison. So I have here, the Asiga Max. I'm gonna copy this over the exact same orientation. Let's create a new build. Let's say we are a Pro 4K80 UV. Let's choose our uh, Bear Guide OS material, 100 micron layers, just so everything is the same. So the build plate kind of looks the same size from here, but watch what happens. Let's go ahead and paste these in. Look at that, look how much more real estate we have. So if you guys are interested or looking at maximizing the output of a 3D printer, you can see how much more space you have on the Pro 4K versus the Asiga Max. Yeah, it's quite That's, a bit. Yeah. So we're, 
we're anxiously awaiting the first shipment. Hopefully it gets here soon um, from Asiga. And once it's here, we'll be able to start playing with it and we'll be able to highlight really the true output for it. But I mean, this could, we could yep. probably, what do you think? Do you think we can get four times this amount? Let's see. Yeah, probably. I think so. It'd be close. I mean, really, I think we could spend some time nesting it and probably get it so it all fits. Mm -hmm. So it says it can't place two, but I think we could probably get oh yeah this to i have to i have to i have to check and see i think we could probably make this happen so just like that i mean you can see you can actually get four times almost four times the amount of output on the pro 4k than you can from a single max now that's of course if your work demands it uh, that's when it would be beneficial I wish we had it here today. We'd actually print this and be able to see how it yeah. turns out. That'd be cool. And just to show a time comparison, this should also give a time comparison. Now it's not gonna take into consideration the separation detection or fast print mode, but saying it would take four hours and one minute. So let's see if it would, four hours and one minutes, <laughs> one minute. Um, let's see if what happens if we enable separation detection and fast print mode. So it's saying it would take this whole print job here three hours and 21 minutes. So uh, 40 minutes longer than what the max would take and you get four times the output. Pretty wild. Yeah, it's pretty impressive. So if you guys have any questions, please feel free to ask. I don't see any filtering through. Uh, let me check the, the Facebook live stream and see if there's anything coming through on that. I had a, a good friend from back home that asked how I was doing. I'm doing great. So I don't know if he's still watching or not. I'll respond to that outside of it. But uh, any other questions, please feel free to ask. And if not, we'll go ahead and we'll, uh, we'll conclude this, this session. Give it a couple more seconds. Don't see any coming through at all. Oh, let's see here. I had a couple come through. Um, looks like we'll have to end it from our end. And then I've heard, um, I have heard printing like that can cause warpage. So uh, somebody asked is, so printing maybe like that, are you meaning like vertically? Um, depending on the printer, it very could, I mean, it could cause warpage if you're not, um, supported properly but printing like this i haven't seen any warpage vertically i mean this is how we print our denture bases and we print them just like that i mean I, have you seen any warpage from this style of printing evan no just like you said if it's under supported um i think an advantage that at least these printers have is their separation mechanism is not like a a it's all a vertical separation yeah. so uh, some of the times uh, when we see you know, issues with printing vertical, if you're using like a swiper method for um, separating or um, or like tilt peels, those can cause issues. Um, but no, the, the th bigger thing you have here and um, which I think is handled pretty well in our resin chemistry, at least for these, our surgical guide material, is you get cure through. So you might have to open your sleeve offset up a little bit and we talked a little bit about this on wednesday um and monday that if you're going to print vertically you're probably going to need a little bit more offset around the sleeve um yeah just because you get a little bit of cure through that that's really the, at least with these printers um really the only thing you got to take into consideration and then just making sure you support it correctly and then don't don't uh, you know you nest them anterior down like corey had not posterior because uh, when you got two pieces coming together, there is potential that if there's a little movement, they don't come to back together, right? But if you start as one piece and then build out, you shouldn't really have issues like that. That's right. Yeah, that's a, a good point there. And also with uh, something that you can do if you're worried about warpage itself, in the design software, you have the ability to add a support bar. Mm -hmm. And so if you're to put a, 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 I guess a lateral bar there, uh, 
on that posterior region of any of those uh, uh, surgical guides, technically that should help prevent warpage or any sort of, uh, I guess, issue where it's deteriorating or, or moving outwards. Now, um, that's a, another advantage to this software. And also you'll see that a lot of people do that with even dentures as well. So with the carbon printer and the new Lucitone material, they do, or at least they did at first, I don't know if they still do or not, but they actually showed the actual uh, brace in between their dentures, which I'm going to guess that is probably to help against warpage, which is mm -hmm. a really good idea to implement. Yeah. Um, you could even do that with models as well. Maybe that would help too. Um, let's see. Any other questions that come through? Justin Scott says, hello. Hey, Justin. Hope all is well down in Florida. Um, let's see. Uh, I think that's it at the moment. So if yep. you guys have any questions, you can email us at product support at .com. And also if you have not registered or re-registered for Monday's webinar, we apologize that it got moved to Tuesday and actually it, it did um, go ahead and it accidentally deleted all of those requests. So you have to resubmit your uh, uh, adjoining the, the webinar for Tuesday, which we're going to be covering RPDs 101 next week, which is really exciting. Um, I think that's, that's it for me. Evan, do you have anything to conclude at all or? Nope. Nope. That's it. I think it covered pretty much <laughs> all there is to cover with printing them. Um, so. Awesome. Uh, I hope everybody has a great holiday weekend. We have a holiday weekend coming up. So hopefully everybody gets a chance to relax and spend time with family in this whole lockdown. So um, yep. thank you all for attending and hope you have a great weekend.